So I um, when I woke up yesterday morning, I, I wanted to talk some more about the building process, and God reminded me of back in 1994, I went to Japan, and in Japan, I received my life verse, and um, maybe it was 92. I don't know. Was it 92 or 94? Well, I don't know. Anyway, it was 92. I don't know. What year did we? It was 92. Whatever. It, it doesn't matter. Um, early 90s. How many of you were born before 92? Okay, just a few of us. The rest of y'all were not on the planet yet. That's when I got my life verse. And so, you know, I was probably 30-ish, 30. I was 29, wouldn't I? I'd be 29, wouldn't I be? Something like that. Anyway, would that be right, 29? 29? Yeah, 29. Um, so let's turn there, Isaiah 58. Um, and he was reminding me of this because... This is the goal of my life. And so, you know, whenever God calls you into something and then you build something, then it becomes the DNA of that structure, right? And everyone has a role in whatever structure that God places you in. Agreed? And so we are... Right now, we're fasting and praying about this transition that God has us in, in order to um, really, it's it's in order to go out and build something with what we already have within our midst, right? Yeah. Do you see that? Are y'all sure you're good? Because I need to find me a partner today that's, because no one is very, okay, it's going to be Sidwell, okay, she's jumping up back there. So... Whenever I was reading this again, it reminded me of our fast, so I just wanted to read it to you again. My life verse is actually down in uh, 12, but let's read some more, shall we? It says, shout it loud and clear. Don't hold back. Let your voice be like a trumpet blast. Declare to my people their rebellion and to Jacob's tribes their sin." Yes, daily they seem to seek me, pretending that they delight to know my ways, as though they were a nation that does what is right and had not rejected the law of their God. They asked me to show them the right way, acting as though they're eager to be close to me. They say, why is it that when we fasted, you did not see us? We starved ourselves and you didn't seem to notice. Because on the day you fasted, you were actually seeking your own desires, and you continue to exploit your, exploit your workers. During your fast, you quarrel and fight with others. You strike them with an angry fist. When you fast like that, your voice will not be heard on high. Do you think I'm impressed with that kind of fast? Is it just a day to starve your bodies, making others think you're humble, and lie down in sackcloth and ashes, do you call that a fast? Do you think I, Yahweh, will be pleased with that? Verse 6. This is the kind of fast that I desire. To remove the heavy chains of oppression. Stop exploiting your, exploiting your workers. Set free the crushed and mistreated. Break off every yoke of bondage. Share your food with the hungry. Provide for the homeless and bring them into your home. Clothe the naked. Don't turn your back on your own flesh and blood. Then my favor will bathe you in sunlight until you're like the dawn bursting through a dark night. And then suddenly your healing will manifest and you will see your righteousness march out before you. And the glory of Yahweh will protect you from all harm. Then Yahweh will answer you when you pray. When you cry out for help, he'll say, I am here. If you banish every form of oppression, the scornful, scornful accusations and vicious slander, and if you offer yourself compassion for the hungry, relieve those in misery, then your dawning light will rise in the darkness and your gloom will turn into noonday splendor. And Yahweh will always guide you where to go and what to do. And he will fill you with refreshment 
even when you are in a dry, difficult place. He will continually restore and stre- restore strength to you, so you will flourish like a well-watered garden and like an ever-flowing, trustworthy spring of blessing. And your people will rebuild long-deserted ruins, building anew on foundation laid long before you. And you will be known as repairers of the city and restorers of, communi- of communities. If you stop pursuing your own desires on my holy day, and you refrain from disregarding the Sabbath. If you call the Sabbath a delightful pleasure and Yahweh's holy day honorable, if you honor it properly by not chasing your own desires, serving your own interests, and speaking empty words, then you will find joyous bliss that comes from serving Yahweh, and I will cause you to prosper and be carried triumphantly over the high places of the land and you will enjoy the heritage of Jacob, your ancestor. Certainly the mouth of Yahweh has spoken it. So, you know, one of the things that's really important, a lot of us, I think, find our life verse in Old Testament scriptures. And, you know, I like BJ. He talks a lot about what Jesus did post cross and resurrection i don't know i'm sure when i'm reading that y'all are probably hearing it through the ears of things that i mean i can just hear your mind while i'm reading it and you know sometimes when we hear scriptures we think of all the things that we're not doing and i don't think that that's really his intention You know, his intention is to, my intention, his intention today, just for me to read this, is simply to let you know that we are known as repairers and restorers. Try to just glean that if you can, right off the top of me reading that, that that's, that is what one life is called to do, to be repairs and restorers. So, what we, how we do that is more important than following this list of stuff that he said here. Yes. See, when we are like, like Bill was, I sent that message out. He said about fasting into a lifestyle that Jesus was able to accomplish on earth as a man without fasting, right? Yes. He just did it one time, yes. remember? That Jesus' life to me is a demonstration of what we should be able to do as humans. Do you believe that? And so what happened, I wish I'd looked it up, but what happened while he fasted for 40 days? He established in his own heart who God needed to be for him to function in his ministry on the earth. That's why he didn't fast at 12. He did it at 30. And so he demonstrated to us all the fasting. When Jesus fasted, the enemy came to visit him. We should have put that in Fasting 101, right? (laughs) While fasting, you will be visited by Lou. And see, to me, the Holy, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, Jesus was. When was he filled with the Holy Spirit? When he was baptized. And remember I said it a few weeks ago, that was the time that God said he was already well pleased. Jesus hadn't done nothing. So he went into the fast. Knowing his identity as a son. Right? So when the enemy came to tell him who he was, he already knew it didn't line up with what he has already been told. So see, if I ever get to the point where when the enemies... See, that what happens in life is the enemy lies to us about what God says we are. 
And when we're immature, we believe him. And so we need a lot of sozos. Yeah. Right? right? But finally, we come to a place of wholeness. And in that wholeness, then God begins to reveal to us our authority and power. Yes. And see, I can't operate in my authority and power without knowing my identity because they are connected. Right. It's because of who I am that I know that allows me to operate and will the things of the Spirit that He gave me permission to operate in. You see, most all of us, you know, we've been in church long enough and we saw people willed their authority and we got all offended by it. You know, offense is the number one thing that the enemy's got going on right now. He's always used that. Right? I was just driving down the road the other day and the light turned yellow prior to my arrival at the intersection. And so I stopped at the red light, all to the dismay of the person behind me who was honking and wildly waving their hands because clearly they were going to run it. They had predetermined it, and they were behind me. I was so thankful they had room to get along beside me and turn over and give me some gestures so they could feel better the rest of their day. People are offended. Right? We need to protect our hearts from being offended. You know, crazy enough, you know, we're sort of, I know some of y'all in here, and we're sort of offended when we choose something for God and then something that we're praying for doesn't work out real well. Have you ever felt really faith-filled and you went and prayed for somebody and then they died? Clearly that's a bummer, right? See, we measure everything by what we've decided when we do that thing, when we pray that thing, when we fast that thing, when we do whatever that thing, when we do that thing, this thing, I do this thing's going to be that, this thing's going to be that, this thing's going to be that, I'm going to do this and I'll have that, and I'll do this and have that, I'll tithe and I'll be this, I'll do this. Do you see how we just pick all these random things? And I'm telling you that is a, it's a trap because God is, we don't have God, He's not a puppet. So then I just tell him, okay, I did this, so move your hand this way. He's already done everything. And so when you think about, okay, this is the DNA of a community of leaders that I've got to then say, I will discover broken things. I will discover... Things that need restoration. See, I propose to you that every single person on earth has things in their life that are broken and need restored. But the successful leaders will allow God to bring to them what God says we're anointed to restore as opposed to focusing on what we just desire to restore. This is a hard leap for some of y'all. I get it. Listen, you're most of y'all in here are in the prime of your life. Like this is the time to build something. This is the time to do something with your resources. This is the time to advance. This is the time that the Holy Spirit is saying, I'm breathing on seeds. I'm wanting to do something and I'm wanting to do it through you. Is everybody in the world in this room? No. Is everybody in your family in this room? No. He's saying it to you. Let him lead them where he's going to say it to them. Everybody in your family is going to question everything you did. But you're here because God said you're a restorer and a repairer. So you better start thinking of the people group. 
that you need to restore and repair. You better start thinking of the people group that you want to restore. See, I wanted to restore pure worship. So I put my effort in it. I found me two, I found me some twins. And I found me a psalmist and I said, let's just get together in the smallest spaces we can (laughs) with dogs barking galore and let's just focus and write. I'm fixing to get together with my word and artist or my illustrator people. We're going to write a book. And so see, this is the season that whatever you set your hand to do for him, that has to do with restoring and rebuilding. Listen, I'm not opposed to going to Andy's and getting ice cream. In fact, Abe and I have got a date. We're going soon. I'm not opposed. But that's just the ice cream on the top of the function. It's not the function. I'm not opposed to having fun, but I want to build. And if you want to go with me, you're going to have to learn to build out of nothing. Because why? Everything needs restoring. There's nothing that doesn't need restoring. There's there's plenty. There's a buffet of opportunity out there. It just depends on if I can get myself off my belly button. Listen, I've been in my belly button. I spent I spent a few years there back in my 20s. I hadn't been there in a while. It's, there's nothing in there. In fact, I, it, in fact, at one point when I had surgery, it my belly button got reshaped. It's a different belly button now. So see, it, there does no good to stay down there because before you know it, it could be remade and you couldn't do anything about it. Didn't have any say in it. Came off the table. I was like, what is that? What happened here? This isn't straight. No one lined this up. I mean, this clearly was not a melon surgeon, you know. Do I have to have plastic surgery just to fix that thing? See, you, you, there's no need to spend time there. We're still not getting life through that. Who was it that had that dream about the lawn? That was you, Gwen. <laughs> so listen, this is, this is just the word for today. So I wanted to read from the Passion about this verse 10. My life scripture is verse 12. But in the Passion, he he made this statement. He said there's five qualifications of last day ministries that are find, found in verse 9 and 10 of Isaiah 58. And he said we have to commit to banish every form of oppression. Did you know that I've been talking to you about the oppression that happened in the garden. Yes. Yeah. Did you hear me talk about that? Yes. Bill talked about it. Yes. It's God's breathing on it right now. Yes. Think about the abortion issue for a second. The reason why it's gotten to where it's gotten is because there's no people group on the earth that are going to live being used by another people group. That's right? Yeah. right? Yeah. So... Let me just walk it through with you, okay? So when men used women for their own pleasure, they produced a product called a child. Then when the men wouldn't be fathers and take care of what men made with women, but the women still became mothers, right? And so it's really hard to talk a mom out of not taking care of their kid. But see, what happened with men was they shucked that responsibility, and so what happened to the women carrying the seed? They wanted to be empowered, right? right? And so we, we they they then decided... I should have a say 
whether this lives or dies because I've been left holding the responsibility of the financial weight. Then we're not going to let you have a job, women, that pays you enough to take care of the thing that we left you with. So you see this, this is where society has gotten to. So we can pass a bunch of laws and, you know, and I'm obviously, you know, where I stand on, you know, what's going on right now in the Supreme Court. But the truth of it is that law is not going to change hearts. In fact, it embitters people because we never educate people to what really happened. And then we never take responsibility. And so, see, there's going to have to be a time when men and women step up and take responsibility for who they really are. And they actually get in their God-given roles. That's what's going to heal the land. Now, in the meantime, I like to make it difficult to kill people. I like to make it, you know, that if you're going to kill an adult, it's going to kill another adult, they'll go to jail. I like that we have some sort of semblance of justice. But that still doesn't change anything. I like it that we're just not going to supply all kinds of ways to kill children and then we're using children did you know we're using children for stem cell research we're using we're at a rapid rate craziness is going on i'm not here to talk about that today but i'm just saying can you not see how the dysfunction and the irresponsibility of what we didn't do well with our lives we did not banish oppression you know, think about, I was watching this show the other day about domestic violence, and it was a show about um, extreme emotional abuse. And I love the way, I'm talking about some serious topics today, aren't I? Are y'all good? I must just need to express it. So in this movie I was watching, it was a show um and it wasn't a documentary or anything. It was just a TV show kind of thing. But the cinematography person had placed this woman that was abused in a deep, deep, deep black hole. You couldn't even tell at first. And they, the way they shot it, they shot it from above. I couldn't even tell what it was at first. But the woman was in a fetal position down in this black, black hole but you could, they had made it to where the sound of everything going on around her was just faded right out into the distance. And I know that this to be true. I'm, I'm pointing this out because this is a people group that I've done a lot with women who have been abused. There's a lot of women in here who have been abused horrifically that you don't even know. And so That's a true statement. That's how it feels. They're in this deep, deep hole. In fact, I've even heard it said that they don't even know the point to coming out because if they came out, all the abuse would still exist. That's something we need to make right. I've spent my life trying to make that right, but what if a bunch of men made that right? I'm powerful and I can make it right. But what if a bunch of men became the person that was <laughs> that stood on the outside of the hole and said, I'll be the safety that you need. That's what this generation needs. Guys, if you wonder what your position is right now, that's it. Because that God is going to repair that. And there are going to, there is going to be men to step up and are stepping up that are going to be in that place. And it is going to repair the breach that has occurred through generation after generation of you, of men using women for their own pleasure. And so you have to remember that when God calls you into something, he begins to help you feel the pain of the person that you're going to repair. It's really important to realize that, that he begins that this morning, Cece, you can tell her, I I mean, ask her, but I was in the green room. I was weeping this morning before service because I was feeling the weightiness 
of the Holy Spirit's heart to repair. I knew I was going to talk about this, that he wants to repair every form of oppression because oppression created an altered state of existence for people. And so then no one is flowing actually in their ministry. And so part of the last day ministries, which we are in, which you are a part of, has to be the mission to actually banish all oppression. That means that you can't participate in being an oppressor in any way. And we should not allow it in our circumstance, in our anywhere around me. We shouldn't allow it. We should not be so small that we see guys, you see another guy talking about a woman a certain way, you should say something. Don't be a wuss. Stand up for, even if it's, they don't even hear you, even if they are mad at you, actually begin to stand up for something that you know is oppressed. We can all get a banner and go stand at the abortion clinic if we want, but the truth of it is if we repair some hearts, we wouldn't even have abortion clinics. Listen, people having sex isn't going to stop. We've been trying to fix that problem for a long time. That is not the That is not the problem. I'm trying to educate you on the potential of what we could do when leaders are anointed and empowered and use the authority of love as our foundation to do something. We won't allow oppression to be in my midst. Yes. Period. Do you agree? Yes. So God's going to set up opportunity for you to practice. Thank you, Papa. T.T. had an opportunity last night. She was on meds, so she didn't do good. But she's going to get to have that chance again. Yeah. Right? Right. She probably don't even know. But see, her neighbor came over and informed her, don't call the police because we're going to be as loud as we want to be over here. We're going to be as drunk as we want to be on it over here. And she said, okay. See, it, those are the moments that God sets up for us to say, no, not on my watch. You don't get to come to tell me over here that you're going to do anything you want in society any way you want. And then I'm supposed to bow to you and make sure I don't bring any authority into it because you don't want to feel bad. Listen, I'm trying to help y'all right now. This is happening in so many places and we've got to have some backbone. We've got to begin to exercise our authority in these little ways. The other thing that he said was we have to remove criticism of others and ministries. Just ask yourself if you're a criticizer. Won't we try it on a really low level, like each other. Yeah. You know, I, I want to tell the truth about what's going on in a situation. I'm a truth teller. How many in here know your truth tellers? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eleven, oh, a couple of last minute popcorn people back there in the back. Well, see, they don't want to be. The, the little sane ones don't want to be. They're just like, yeah, okay. Look at them. You're all meant to be truth tellers. I know you're too wimpy to raise your hand today because, you know, you think I'm getting on to you. But listen, you're all meant to be truth tellers. But you've got to learn to tell the truth in love. See, what happens is we encounter a situation we know is wrong, but we're so lackadaisical in our standards. And we don't want to offend over allowing allowance. And that's why the Holy Spirit's grieved today. Because... The truth of it is that our minds are meant to be renewed. How did your mind get renewed? Somebody told you a truth that you didn't know before. Left to yourself? You would take that crap you're thinking and you would make stuff with it. Am I telling you the truth or what? 
And so you've got to share. See, what we've chosen to do is we just don't tell anybody. We just keep it inside. But it's happening in our decisions. It's happening in our choices. And then we begin. That's what I said. There's going to be a day when people are going to say, I know you by your fruit. A fruit. I can tell you have not been in the secret place. I can tell you haven't learned to worship long enough that you broke through. It's not a 30 minute gig. I can tell that you just come here and you sleep most of the time. You don't do anything with it when you go home because you're your fruit. I can tell there's going to come a day where we talk to each other that way. Hey, brother, your fruit is like, I don't want to eat it. Like, are you really wanting to bring that up in here? See, if you're going to lead a team, you're going to have to be able to have that kind of discussion. Why? Because we, we have been given this power. We've been given this authority. We've been given this assignment. We've been given these gifts. Jesus died so he could hand out gifts to you. You have gifts. You have anointing. They need to be protected. They need to be maintained. They need to be oiled. It's just like a car. I tell you all the time, it's like a car. You can't ever not do anything to your car. Have you ever had a car and you didn't clean it? Nobody wants to get in that thing. In fact, it's a reflection of how well you take care of everything else in your life. Have you ever gone to the dentist and had cavities? It's a reflection. Of how well, of course, not with Mendel now, you know, she recently had a root canal just because she injured her tooth when she was a baby, when she was a kid. Isn't that crazy? She didn't even remember it. But see, they're indicators. That was an injury. That was an indicator of a trauma. Did you know right now she, I have to tell it, she's got a piece of cotton back behind her tooth that is coloring it right now back to its normal. That's weird. That's technology for you, isn't it? Huh? It's inside her tooth. How did they get that thing in there? She's got to go back later and they got to take that thing out. Why? Because, see, that's the thing, is that injury created a discoloration. She didn't remember the injury, but when they said, hey, has this happened? Maybe that's why it's happened. That nut, that nerve is dead. It's crazy. That's what happens to us. So this is a tribe of repairers and restorers. What? has been repaired in you? What has been restored in you? Then you should be able to see someone else that has the thing that has been repaired and restored in you. Right? So then you're able to do what? You're able to have, number one, compassion, empathy, right? Remember when Jesus looked over the city, he wept. Do you ever weep? <laughs> Do you ever weep over the city? Not just the buildings. Sometimes when I see y'all, I, I see that you just don't know. You just don't know what I know. I want you to know what I know. I try to tell you what I know so you can know it too, but I can tell by your actions you just don't know who you are yet. But see, you see other people that don't know what you know. What are they doing with what they know? They're out making messes, stabbing people with scissors. They're just out running amok, right? But see, you're meant to see someone that was like you and say to them, you don't have to be like me. I can help you. That's a restorer. You know, whenever you restore furniture, we restored a lot of furniture. You know, there's lots of ways to do it. You know, if you really have a real piece of wood, which they don't make anymore. <laughs> let me tell you, none of the Ikea stuff is real wood. Anyway, they, they, there's something underneath there that is of value. All the stuff on top was just placed on there by someone who previously owned it. Your life is the same way. You were not your own ever. You served either the enemy or God. When you served the enemy, he painted you. 
and stained on you. Put stuff on you all the time. Other people came by and maybe enjoyed it. Maybe you tatted it up. Maybe you did something else to it, colored it, whatever. That was a sign of who's, who owned you. But see, the restoration process comes and the Holy Spirit comes and he has to strip off all of the old because you can't see what's of value underneath there. And see, sometimes we don't like that stripping process. We think it should be over. Remember when you first got saved and you thought it was going to be a five-minute deal? I did remember we had that guy, we did a sozo, and he said that when he came to a sozo, he wanted me to hit a home run. And I was thinking, well, you maybe you won't even get up to bat. I don't know if we're going to use this baseball analogy. We're probably still in the bullpen or somewhere, you know, on deck circle. He wanted to be a one and done. So he had to leave because it wasn't a one and done. He was still tormented at night. He's the guy I tell the story about how he had nightmares since he was 10 years old, remember? But see, he, he, he left. And his life has taken all kinds of bad turns over and over and over again. So see, when that process of restoration begins and God begins to strip things, he begins at first that stripping is like better than the yucky thing, right? But see, after a while, he'll come and ask you. He'll come and ask you to lay down something that he can strip from you. You know, what? what is he trying to do? He's trying to give you the heart of a father. He's trying to give you the compassion for what you came out of so that it's stronger and it's more resilient, and it has been anointed, and it's been through the fire, it's been through the refining, so that it actually can actually deal with what is going on in somebody else. Have you ever tried to help somebody, and they really were a little bit stubborn? (laughs) Lynn and I are going to have a redo next Wednesday because we had a chat about it. Lynn, Lynn had gotten a little bit seized up on Wednesday night. She was seized up before then, but... She'd gotten all triggered. And so it's hard to be vulnerable when you're triggered. She couldn't do it Wednesday night. I love Gwen. She said she went home with Jackie and said, do you think we'll ever be like that? I was like, oh, we need a redo on that. You know, he's he's asking us to be real. He's asking us just to admit where we are. He's asking for us to willingly just be vulnerable in front of a group of people to say, hey, this is where I'm in. This is what I need help with. You know, this is what I need to change. Why? Because it's in that position, in that placement of love, that we are loved into wholeness. And that's what he's saying, is that we've got to banish oppression. We've got to remove all criticism. We've got to forbid gossip and slander we got to have compassion for the disenfranchised. We have to comfort those that are enduring suffering and tragedy. You know, I was really praying for the little Judd family today when I was listening to little Ashley Judd this morning, and I was thinking, you know, that, that it was just such a sad story because they were getting ready for her mom to receive this award, and she was at home with her mom. And they were all going to be going to the um, uh, Hall of Fame thingy. Sorry. And she actually, someone came, was coming over to see her mom. And when Ashley Judd went out of the house to meet the woman, her mom killed herself in the upstairs room. And in that, I was watching this play out. And, and you know, Winona is the older sister But she wrote a letter and said, I've got to go deal with this on your own. You be the spokesperson, little young girl. I was thinking, wow, that whole family's been set up that way. You know, if you know, I just watched a story weirdly with Mark Lowry. He was talking to Winona Judd the other day. And that woman's story is crazy. But see, they were raised by a mom who had severe depression her whole entire life 
And think about it, that, that, that display is going to have a ripple effect. They were influential. And you, we've got to think about things that are in society that are, influ- even if they don't influence us, they're influencing yeah. people. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. They're, this, I mean, I don't even think it was a, I don't, I think she deliberately chose to do it during mental health month to bring about more emphasis on how many, how much mental health distress she was in. Because see, no one has an answer for it. The pills aren't working. The counseling's not working. What's going to be our answer to this depression, to this oppression of the enemy? What's going to, I mean, right now, think about all the things going on in the country. If you just watch any news, which I don't, <clears throat> you know, there's crazy stuff being said. I mean, there's a movie that just came out about how there were all these mules at the election, mules being people, that that went and collected ballots that that made Biden win the election. Well, that's blowing up everywhere, too. There's just stuff. I mean, people are just telling it everywhere. Think about all the stuff going in chaos, but yet, look at where you are. You're so protected. You're under the covering, but you have the answer for so many problems. That's why it's so important. That's what I'm saying. Be thinking, be prayerful about what can you do right now with what you have right now. You can't go see everybody in the world. We can't save everybody in the world, but we can save who God told us to save. He has positioned us here. We are an empowered group of people. We are on the edge of prophetic words going out that are resonating throughout the land of all the prophetic people. We're not missing a thing. So it must mean that we're on the cutting edge of doing something really great. And so it is time to build. It is time to partner together. It is time to realize that this is what we're called to do. So we've got to begin to think this way. We've got to begin to think that I have been empowered to do something with my life that no one else but me can do. You know, I think it's really important that we realize that because that this is the time that God is really restoring worship, especially on the earth, pure worship. You know, it's not about, um, you know, a style or it's about actually um, God restoring hearts back to what a heart would say when it knows it's loved. You know, when Mary poured out, when she gave that demonstration, see, when Mary poured out her perfume in front of everyone, think about it, I've, I've talked about it a lot, but that was the greatest form of worship because no one knew exactly who Jesus was. Just a few handful of people. But it was something so valuable to her. And the, and all the men around there knew her, knew her reputation, knew where she came from, knew how much, how much money she didn't have. And so to waste that, it was, it was a representation of what we have to do in our heart rending towards God. We have to say, you know, God, where I came from. You know where you found me. And you know that my worship is going to cost me everything. And if it costs me something here now, then it's going to, that smell of my worship is going to permeate when you actually go to the cross and you actually give your life. That is going to be a lasting effect. And see, that's the kind of worship that God has called us to restore. But guess what? It's not just worship. 
It's in writing. It's in art. It's in speaking. It's in finances. It's in our demonstration of love. For, I mean, every single area, I can't even think of all of them right now, but every single area that God would actually ignite within your heart, he wants it to be returned back to the purity of what it would be to do it at his feet. And when everything in our heart is reduced back down to that this costs me everything, every single thing in my life. In fact, we can't even think about, I'm sorry, but we can't even think about our family or our children or what we think we've lost or where we wish they would be or how we wish they weren't in pain or how we wish they weren't in a struggle or what they're doing with their lives. Because at the end of the day, God's going to just ask you, did you know me? And did you do what I said? And see, whenever you come here and you say, okay, I'm giving my life to God, I want to learn how to be a repairer and a restorer, then there's going to be a specific area that God asks you to be involved in. It's just the way it is. That's part of our surrender. I love the last thing I'm going to talk about is what he said that when we do this, the way God said, he said, these are his promise, promises. He says that our spiritual light, which is our influence, will increase to community. Wow. So see, we're doing a fast unto a lifestyle to become a repairer and a restorer, yeah. right? Yes. So that means that I'm learning right now What's in the way of me thinking about being a repairer and a restorer every day and making plans for it? That's what we're fasting all the stuff to show that we're not going to die without having it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. right? Yes. We're fasting into a lifestyle to say, I will give up these things. Maybe you're learning you need to give those up for a lifetime. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I didn't ask anybody what they're fasting. But see, he's asking you to actually get before him during the season where there's nobody you can call. There's nobody that you can text. There's nobody on the lifeline letting you know if you can buy a hamburger or not. There's nobody there you're talking to because you're trying to be talking to him. You're trying to ask him, where is my, where, and I come out of this fast, where am I going to be positioned? And so he's saying, this is a time where his promise over us during this fast is that our spiritual light of influence will increase. Discouragement and gloom will disappear from our lives forever. That tells me what I was doing was producing gloom. See, fasting produces a spiritual awareness that you don't have any other time. That's why that if you can't maintain it, you've got to keep fasting it. See, no, this is what you understand. God gives you permission to do anything, but you have to decide if it's a distraction for you or not. If you don't know that, you need seasons of fasting and fasting. Before I ever started One Life, I, I went for years and I fasted every single week. So don't tell me that it doesn't take, it takes effort to fast over and over and over until your flesh says, well, I don't even know why I need that anymore. My heart and flesh cries out for the living God. Discouragement and gloom will disappear forever. God will give us specific guidance in counsel to know what to do and where to go. I'm not even supposed to be in charge of that. I didn't even know what I was going to say when I came in here today. I was in there crying. I didn't even know. I told men, I don't even know why I'm crying. I was just, I felt such a grievous heart from the, he was so grieved. He was so, he was so grieved for humanity today. He wanted humanity to know that he had the answer to everything. He will fill us with renewing grace, even when we're surrounded by difficult situations. Remember that thing I said the other week about the guy was saying about that little thing about the two fish swimming around, remember? And the one guy says, man, don't you love this beautiful water? And the young fish says, what water? And he was saying, that's like grace. We're all, you don't know it, but you are in a sea of grace. Otherwise, when you're sitting there having a bad thought, you'd just be struck down dead right here in the room. When you when it comes to giving a minute, 
And Cheryl challenges you and the Holy Spirit says, hey, give a thousand dollars. And you're like, well, I'll give that next week. You'd be struck down dead right then. This is grace. You get to pick whether you obey or not. You don't even, he's not going to be mad if you don't obey. Because everything in this life is about obeying into reward, not obeying into salvation. Salvation was free. Our spiritual lives will flourish like a lush garden with fruit and beauty. Fruit and beauty. We're about to tear up our little tiny piece of dirt we made last year. Killed our tree. Killed my tuna dollar tree. Even though we were out there just, we were just, we were kissing on it every day. It just died anyway. Found out it wasn't supposed to be downhill, supposed to be up on a berm, got too much water, just froze itself right up to death, rusted away. So I got me an evergreen. You can't kill them things. I don't like them. I don't like them, but I got me one. Why? Because then we could just put that there, right? But see, it's not, it's a, it's a dry old, I need to just have cactus if I just liked them. I, I could just, I could grow cactus because you don't have to do anything. But see, right now it's not pretty. But see, I have a vision for it. I bought plants with a vision that I have. I don't know if I'm going to be able to keep it alive. I never have been able to, but I'm still going to do it. Yeah. And see, that's the thing about your life is that it just gets all weedy. Yeah. Yeah. Not only do you get in the weeds, you are a weed. <laughs> and so every now and then it's got to be recultivated and new hope and new seeds got to be planted in it and guess what he's the author he's the finisher he began it you didn't even begin it it's his vision of you not even you we will not cease to be an ever flowing source of blessing to others Acts 3 Four. That's where you find that. Three and four. Just read Acts. That's what we want to be around here. I want to be that community where everything gets restored. Everything gets renewed. There's no needs among them. Listen, I don't know if you know it, but we have been supplying emotional need. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right? right? Chrissy, y'all should reread. I wanted to reread it today, but, you know, clearly I didn't get to. But her word from last week where she was just saying that we all now have to manage our own soul. Whether you get an ice cream or not, you've got to manage that. You don't need to ask anybody that. You can ask the Holy Spirit that. There's all kinds of questions He has answers to. Right? We will be given God's grace to rebuild lives and institutions in our cities, churches, and nations. That's what He's doing right now. We, and he, we will take up the legacy of our spiritual parents and build on their foundations. You know, I was going to talk today about foundations, but the foundation that we're building on is love. The last two are we will have a testimony of healing cities. That's what Tessa was t- giving y'all today. She was giving you a testimony of transgender people being healed. It's the same thing happened to them that happened with what I was talking about with abortion. It's the same thing. There's going to be a result of transgender, just like there is a result of what happened with Roe v. Wade. It's the same thing. So many places we fell down on the job. And we let control and abuse take over and it produced a fruit that now we're living in. And so guess what? You're the generation that has to come along and repair what was broken before you got to the planet. That's your job. That's your assignment. It doesn't matter how it happened. It doesn't matter if you, yeah, you had it. Everyone had it. Everyone living in this generation experienced lack of fathering and abuse. It's not a thing, but are we going to repair it? Last thing is we will restore well-being or wholeness to our communities. That's what he's calling for us to do now. This is the fast he's requiring of us to actually move into a lifestyle of believing that what I came out of, I now am able to restore in other people. It doesn't matter if you're just two minutes on the other side of it. Once you've had truth, you just had truth. You can't go back. 
And so this is a time to fast into that lifestyle and to begin to build. Come on, Mendel. Wow. Such a powerful word, Tisa. Thank you so much. Wow. There's so much going on. It's so exciting. There's so many prophetic messages. I um, hope you have just a little bit more room in your noggin and in your heart right now because I have a few a few other prophetic things to share. Um, of course, there's so many. Okay, I'm just going to start with a couple, okay? A couple fast ones. Um, do you guys remember when the big ever green ship got stuck in the Suez Canal last year? Well, there was a huge prophetic message in that. You know, it was right where the Red Sea part was parted back in the Bible day, and the ship got stuck there. Well, the name of that ship was Ever Given, and and I, I've just kind of been seeking it, searching it out, and I... I sought this out back then too about the prophetic message in that and ever given to me that ship and what happened there was um, represented Jesus. And so I want to propose to you that now I see it as he was saying, I've given everything. I've given everything. Well, just last month, I think it was, there was another evergreen ship that got stuck in a waterway, but this time it was in the United States and it was only stuck for like, I think 30 days. But I, I knew there was a, some sort of a prophetic message there, and um, that ship was called Ever Forward, okay? And it was in the United States. So I just want to propose to you again that, that the Holy Spirit is saying, I've already given everything, and I've drawn your attention to what I gave and the miracles that I did in the past when I parted the Red Sea, and I'm doing a new thing in the United States and I have, and we're going forward from here, ever forward, ever forward. And on that note, please be in prayer. I heard um, that there's going to be a major announcement from the Supreme Court tomorrow on the 16th. And I don't know what it's going to be about yet, but let's be in prayer because obviously the abortion issue is a hot, hot bed right now, a hot top. Okay, so that's one thing. Now, um, Friday night I had, (laughs) she knows how much I'm trying to sort through. Um, Oh, Lord, Jesus, help me. Um, Okay, I'm just going to list them all. He brought them to my mind. Okay, so Tisa mentioned the root canal in my tooth, right? And you remember she sent out the the prophetic message in that and the metaphor. And I can't remember. I don't think I shared this last week. I meant to, but I there was so much then too. But the tooth, you know, they number your teeth. Did I share about the number of my teeth? Okay. Well, they I saw on a piece of paper when I was at the dental dentist office that it was tooth number nine was the tooth that was injured where the, the root and the nerve had died, so the sensitivity had been killed off. And well, it was number nine, was that tooth, and nine represents judgment. So if you remember, last week we talked about being immersed in God's judgment, immersed in seeing things as he sees things. And so I just want to say again, he is restoring the sensitivity and getting rid of the dead, decayed nerve that didn't work anymore to our ability to judge like him. So again, please please listen to that word again and remember to be immersing yourself in God's judgment. So then Friday night, um, I had a dream and um, I didn't know that, you know, Saturday morning, Tisa woke up and was like she shared, sharing her, um, had her life verse on her mind, which she got in Japan. And so Japan has always had a reference in her mind to the DNA of one life because it's where it kind of began. She happened to be in Japan at that time. So when I dream every now and then, I will dream about something in Japan. And I know for me that it's a reference to one life. And so I had a dream um, Friday night and I realized it took place in Japan. And so while she's thinking about her life first from Japan, on Saturday morning, I'm waking up thinking about a dream I had that took place in Japan. So I know this is a message for our house. 
And so in the dream, basically, I was walking through a very large hotel complex kind of thing. And I there was a I was just walking and walking and saw lots of different scenes. But um, two scenes stood out to me, I was walking down a, a a hallway and saw different hotel rooms. And I just as an observer knew what was happening in the hotel room. And in both rooms, these were separate rooms. One was a, had a, a woman in it and another one was had a man in it. But they were both paying for intimacy, okay? The implication was they had paid for somebody to come to their room for intimacy. Um, but it was interesting because in the man's room, especially uh, the, the time skipped ahead and I saw towards the end of the evening, everybody there was sleeping. But there was a couch, and there was a large chair, and then there was a big old bed. Well, there were people sleeping on the couch, and then the the main uh, focus of my dream, the man, was sleeping in this large chair. And it stood out to me that here's a massive bed, and nobody was in the bed. And I just knew in the dream that this man had made a vow to himself that he would never sleep in that bed again. And because he knew that the bed was reserved for true love. And what he was doing was a substitute for intimacy. And so both rooms were participating in a substitute for intimacy. But the guy knew it wasn't genuine. He knew that he was never, he would not rest in true love. It's like it was reserved for some, somebody for him, you know. And so then the next scene in the dream that I was walking through, like I said, this massive complex, and all of a sudden I realized that I was in the middle of a private event, like a wedding. And I had been like in a public area, now I was at a private event, and I, I was already more than halfway through their, their space when I realized, and so I decided I would just find an exit and leave the building altogether, and I would walk around the outside of the building to try to find my way back to wherever I was going. And um, so that I wouldn't have to walk back through their private event, you know. So what I believe this dream is representing is it's showing us as a tribe that there, the world is looking for substitutes for intimacy, and they, but they know it's not the real thing. They know they are not resting in true love. They are not experiencing true intimacy. They know it. And so the hunger is there. The need is there. There's no denying that. But when Tisa read that scripture at the beginning of the service about the brides being ready for a wedding day, the part of my dream where I walked through a wedding, it represents people are, are invited to a wedding. They're invited to the private event of a wedding, but they think they don't belong. And so they just leave the building and they're going to walk around the perimeter of the wedding. They're just going to stay on the outside to try to find their way instead of staying in the wedding that they're actually invited to. So as Tisa shared her message today, I knew that this was, at first I thought it was us, the people in this house were needing to make sure they were participating in true intimacy but we know that, and that's always true for us. We want to be intimate with him in a genuine, authentic way. And I think the real significance of the dream was that this is what we're called to repair. This, this is what we're called to repair in people. True love and in intimacy with, with Jesus. There's only one God, as we sang today. You know, there's only one we serve. And so this is an area that we, that the world is desperate to be um, redeemed in them, the desperate to be restored. And so this is a, a real focus for us to, re, to, cur to bring people into wholeness of true intimacy, true love with their Father, with Jesus, and help them realize that they are actually invited to the wedding. They don't have to stay on the outskirts and find their way on the outside of things. It's intentional that they're in the middle of the wedding. Now, to go along with this, I stu it stood out to me that the night before, I had watched and heard this little thing about the Kentucky Derby, which I don't remember if Tisa's mentioned it on a text lately or not, but if you haven't heard the story about this year's Kentucky Derby, seek it out and find it because it's incredible. 
and then go and watch the the little clips, especially of the overhead view of the horse race. I was in tears. I watched it several times, and it just makes me cry every time because it represents what God's doing. And you can you'll just know it when you see it. It's incredible. Watch it. Um, and then go find Johnny Inlow's prophetic word about the interpretation of what happened. Also incredible, very deep, very um, specific about what God's doing in the world right now. It's very, very incredible. But the Holy Spirit gave me a prophetic word that Johnny Inlow didn't talk about. He, just one little part of the race that stood out to me. Um, the overhead view of the race, if you go and watch it, you can hear um, the announcer. I think it was on NBC is the version that I heard. Um, the announcer, it's really interesting because you're hearing him talk, and it's so crazy because they don't even talk about the guy, this horse, Rich Strike, okay? He was had 80 to 1 odds. He wasn't even supposed to be in the race until the day before, and there was the last horse, horse number 20, the 20th position, wasn't able to race, so horse number 21 got put in, and that was this horse. First major race for this horse and for the jockey and for the trainer and for the owner, who happens to be from Oklahoma. 80 to 1 odds. They weren't even talking about this horse. They weren't even talking about it, okay? And it's, oh, it's such an incredible message. And he ran a patient race waited at the back he rate he waited at the back of of the of these other 20 horses and when the time was right he started making his move and it's so powerful the announcer he's neck and neck with the horses in the lead and the announcer still isn't talking about him it's like they can't even see him and he just bolts and he wins the Kentucky Derby in 80 to 1 odds Never the this announcer said he had to go and look up how to even pronounce the jockey's name because it was not on their radar at all. Not on their radar at all. Now it was interesting because one of the things that these people have said about the race after the fact is that there was a horse that set the pace at the front of the race. Okay, it was only like a two-minute and 2.2 minute race or something like that. Not a very long race. Well, the, uh, some horses set the pace at the front of the race. Now, I don't know anything about horse racing, so this is just my understanding currently. But, of course, when the, there's a horse that set the pace and all the other horses are trying to keep up with him, and they, it was an extremely fast pace right out of the gate that is not considered good. They even called it a suicidal pace. Okay, the first leg of the race, it was like in 45 seconds. And so basically, these horses set a pace that all the other horses tried to keep up with that exhausted them at, in the earlier part of the race. And so the winning horse was patient and waited and ran the race he knew he was supposed to run. And then when the time was right, he just weaved through all of them and took off and left the people who had set the pace, the horses who had set the pace, in the dust, okay? So it was interesting, as I said, the announcer's just going on and on, talking about all these horses. Well, one of the horses that they named, um, he says, in Japan's crown prince, crowd pride, sorry, Japan's crowd, crown pride, okay? He just mentions that horse. Well, the Holy Spirit highlighted that to me, jumped out at me, and I, and I didn't think about it again until the next morning when I realized I had a dream about Japan, that they mentioned Japan's crown pride. They hadn't mentioned any other horse's country of origin, you know, but it mentioned Japan's. So it turns out after some research that Japan, this was only the second time in the history of the Kentucky Derby that a Japanese bred horse ran in the Kentucky Derby. So it was a big deal. So that's probably why the announcer um, mentioned it, Japan's crown pride. But as I was researching it, they said that this uh, horse, Crown Pride, it was one of the pace setters, okay? It was at the front. It was neck and neck with the other horse that was setting the pace, Crown Pride. It was a, this horse is a grandson of a horse named Sunday Silence, okay? Related to a horse named Sunday Silence. It set a suicidal pace. Okay, now I'm put this message together after spending a lot of time with the Holy Spirit. The dream 
And this story, why the Holy Spirit um, pointed this out to me, this is my interpretation. Pride, okay, crown pride, has developed from a lineage of silence in the church and has led to a substitution for intimacy instead of resting in intimacy and true love. Pride has set a suicidal pace. Think about what Tisa talked about today. It's what everybody was talking about. It was promoted in the media. Everybody was talking about this horse. Nobody was talking about the winning horse. The church was silent. Pride has developed from a lineage of silence in the church, which has led to a substitute for intimacy instead of a place of resting in intimacy and true love. That is our mission field. That's, the, that's what we need to develop. That's what we need to rebuild and restore. It's time for the church to no longer be silent and allow these things to develop in God's children. So lastly, I have to read this word again that I read at the beginning of service and, I, and, I, and comment on it just a tiny bit. I was, as Tisa said, I was sitting under this tree. It's a huge willow tree, massively, massive willow tree, in which willow trees have these thin little small leaves, but a bunch of them, right? And so I'm laying there in my chair, and I'm watching it hang over me, and that's when the Holy Spirit started talking to me about these little leaves are my protection, okay? So get the picture that I'm laying there like these tiny little leaves are my protection. Well, again, if you only looked at one little leaf, it wouldn't seem like something very powerful. It, that would not be a very big covering. It's like the size of my pinky, just about, you know. That would not be a very big covering, and it would not look and appear to be a sign of um, extreme protection. But all of these leaves, when you put them all together, provide a massive canopy, a massive canopy. And so he was showing me in this word and in, in that moment that that's his protection, it looks like something that we can't quite wrap our mind around, and we would miss it if we if we didn't know him. If we didn't weren't intimate with him, we would miss how his how um, evident his protection is and how much it's in our lives. And the cool thing about it is, I watch the wind blow, that the leaves are all move right. So that makes it uh, as something that could, as his winds of change blow through our life. He moves those leaves into protection to cover us in just the right way. And it provides shade for the seeds, like we sang about today. It provides shade. So I'm going to read this word again and then have one other comment. What grows in the shadows of hope was the question. What grows in the shadows of hope? The picture here is that you've got to have the covering to provide the shadow of hope. You've got to have the covering of the leaves of the trees of his protection to provide a shadow for hope to actually grow in so that there's safety for people's seeds to develop. You have to have the protection. Like a million little leaves, you provide protection for me, a covering that goes sometimes unseen in its infancy. How could something so small be a covering for me, for this wide expanse of territory? How could something so tender provide protection for me in this wide world that so often seems so threatening? I sense that it's beyond my understanding, but somehow exactly like your kind of fathering. You don't need me to understand how your protection works. It's not a tool for me to wield, just something for me to trust. I see the beauty in your design and marvel at the genius of it all. Wouldn't it be just like you to send a tender shoot to save me? Wouldn't it be just like you to provide protection in something so unassuming? Your winds position each leaf in perfect position for the day. They move and flow with your winds of change, pivoting from the anchor of your name. 
providing always a collective canopy to overshadow me, a place of rest, a place of trust where hope's shadow brings seeds to life and new beauty can blossom inside this garden heart of mine. Isaiah 53, 2. I read it in the Passion Translation earlier. I'm going to read it in the voice now. Out of emptiness, he came like a tender shoot from rock hard ground. He didn't look like anything or anyone of consequence. He had no physical beauty to attract our attention. Like a tender shoot. It's just like Jesus. In the Passion, again, I have to read it again. He sprouted up like a tender plant before the Lord, like a root in parched soil. He possessed no distinguishing beauty or outward splendor to catch our attention, nothing special in his appearance to make us desire him. So get the connection here. It's just as I wrote. Wouldn't it be like you to send a tender shoot to save me? Those leaves, I wouldn't think they're protection but they are. And so Jesus, when Jesus came to the earth, people didn't realize who they were talking to. And I want to propose that we don't realize the protection that's all around us, the safety that's been provided for us. And you know, when we don't feel safe, we go into our own self-protection and making our own way. Wouldn't it be just like you to provide protection in something so unassuming? It's a direct reference to Jesus. Now, that verse references another verse earlier in Isaiah 11.1. In the Passion Translation, it says, The cut-off stump of Jesse will sprout, and a fruitful branch will grow from his roots. Now, at face value, that's a reference to King David. The cut-off stump of Jesse will sprout at this point in Isaiah David's family line, who's supposed to always be somebody on the throne from David's line, well, it's been um, oppressed. The cut-off stump of Jesse will sprout, and a fruitful branch will grow from his roots. That's a reference to Jesus also. But I want to read the footnote here. It says the Hebrew word for branch or twig is netzer, to grow green is what that means. And it's the root word for Nazarene, Nazarite, Nazareth. Christ is both the root and the offspring of David. This means means that the branch that grows from the roots, which represent his spirit and nature, points to the body of Christ, his church on the earth. Christ in us is the vine, and we are his fruitful branches. Jesus Christ branches out through his people, and grows from his root. Overcomers are the branches that bring forth the fruit of Christ's life. This sprout will grow to become the rod of God's power. The picture here, in case you didn't catch it, is Jesus provides the protection for us. He's the the tender shoot that sprouts up from the cut off stump. He is the protection for us that provides this covering over us. And in response to what grows in that shadow of hope and that shadow of his protection from our lives, we become the branches. We become the fruitful branches for others. We become the collective canopy from the word. The collective canopy, all those individual leaves, those are us. They represent Jesus, but they represent us too. So it's people that provide the collective canopy of protection over God's children that produce a hope and a protection and a safety for the seeds within them to grow. So this is a call for us to be be those people to be the collective canopy, to fully receive and sit under the protection of Jesus, the protection of what grew out of the cut-off stump of Jesse, fully receive it, stay in that position, be immersed in his judgment, fully recognize the protection and the hope 
that you are under so that the seeds can grow in our own lives so that we can be the restorers and repairers of the cities and the communities by being a collective canopy over others. So, Papa, I just want to say thank you. Holy Spirit, I just thank you. Jesus, we thank you. Holy Spirit, we love the way you speak to us. We say there's there's no such thing as too much of a prophetic message. There's no such thing as too many prophetic words. You can speak to us however you want to. So just bring it on, Jesus. Bring it on, Holy Spirit. Just speak to us. Speak to us. Fuel the fire within us. Stir it up and cause it to flare up even bigger. Stir it up in us, Lord. We want to be the repairs and the restorers. We it want we want it to be us. We say it's us, and we recognize that this is a shifting season in the body of one life where we are shifting from not just hearing words about ourselves, but about other people that are needing us to be who we're called to be. So I just thank you, Holy Spirit, for all that you've done in our lives. I thank you, Papa. You're such a good, good father. I thank you, Jesus, for all that you've already given to us, to this tribe, to us as individuals. And we'll say we will go forward with you. We will go ever forward with you with what has already been given to us and we will be the collective canopy over your children. We will be the fruitful branches over the body, over the children that need to know your intimacy, need to know true love and the resting place place of true love. So do it in us, Papa. Do it in us. Do it in us, Holy Spirit. Do it in us, Jesus. We are the target. We are the we are candidates. We just say we are candidates. We fully recognize it. So I just speak a a covering right now over this word today. We just ask you, Holy Spirit, to continue to rain down on on this word, rain down on the seeds of our heart. You reign with a G over the seeds today. And we will continue to choose and align ourselves with your judgment. We will immerse ourselves in your judgment as you restore our sensitivity to judge rightly. So we just thank you, and I just release a blessing over everyone in the room today and everyone hearing the sound of of my voice, and we just say, let it be done, let it be done, let it be so. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's welcome Cheryl. I'm just saying, he's already been building on that because that verse that that Cece's referencing, Tisa has preached on before, it's called the, the seed in the stump. And so be a good throwback for you and so he's coming full circle because we sang about seeds today it's really good you know what i'm gonna talk about the cost i'm gonna talk about how much it cost man god is so cool because he lined up that we would read this chapter and talk about it today so i'm gonna pull from it um she says divine concepts that rock the world are often costly What is God asking you and me to co-create with him? What will we need to devote to it in in terms of time, skills, and funds? And so that brought me to Luke 14, um, starting at 27. It says, anyone who comes to me must be willing to share my cross and experience it as his own, or he cannot be considered to be my disciple. So don't follow me without considering what it will cost you. For who would construct a house before first sitting down to estimate the cost to complete it? Otherwise, he may lay the foundation and not be able to finish it, which is what we're talking about. And so, you know, it's really cool because I think that sometimes we will try to calculate what it will cost, and it's really easy. It's going to cost everything. And so free yourself up today. Free yourself up from trying to put a time constraint of this fasting period's only going to be a month long because it's actually going to be your whole life. Free yourself up from saying, I'm going to give this much this week because it's actually going to be everything. The, the more you open up to that, the freer you'll be. So good. And so, you know, I think that another thing I was thinking about, too, is some of the stuff that he's calling us to fast right now are actually freeing up places in our finances. 
I know just f- for us personally, we, we stopped subscribing to certain media outlets. And so that's money that is freed up. And so be thinking about that, too, that um, things that you are, are fasting into a lifestyle, um, that that is going to be more momentum for us to build, which is what we're doing. So we got a couple ways you can partner with us today. We've got our box back there. You can put cash and checks in there, notate on the envelope how you want to give. We've also got our website. It's onelifeok.com. And then we use Cash App, which is on your mobile device. And our handle for that is dollar sign one life okay. Let's stand and do our offering decree. Papa, all abundance is in your hands. I say my heart is filled with gratitude today for all that you provide while I seek first the kingdom in my life. I say today that I will steward well what you put into my hands this year. I will seek wisdom for the abundance you are pouring out into my hands this year. This is a year of expansion and growth. So I speak to the north, south, east, and west and say, release what is the king's. Release what is meant for the kingdom. Release what is meant for growth. Release, release, release. I speak for the resources to be unlocked. I speak to any blockage to be unlocked. I speak to any finances that are imprisoned to be unlocked. Unlock, unlock, unlock. I speak to creativity to be unhindered. I speak the favor of God and man over my life this year. I will use my creativity to expand. Creativity, arise, arise, arise. Papa, I say make way, make way for the king this year in my life, in the life of my tribe through your abundance. There's more with you in 22. So, Daddy, I just thank you for this season that we're in. I thank you for the word today that we are laying an amazing foundation. In Jesus' name, amen.